Well, good morning. This morning we're in Psalm number 37. Psalm number 37 presents two challenges to us. One, Psalm 37 challenges us spiritually. It challenges us to think about our relationship with God and challenges us to think about our connection to sin. How do we respond when we flip and when we fall? How does God respond when we cry out? The other challenge is more practical, more pragmatic. Psalm 37 is 40 verses long. It's one of the longest psalms we've encountered so far during these devotionals. And so we're not going to be able to look at every verse in terms of in-depth. We're going to read through it. Here and there, I'll stop and light upon something I find fascinating or maybe I'll hope to find challenging for you. And then we'll keep moving on. But let's go ahead and start into it so as not to waste any more time. David begins, Fret not yourself with or because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Have you ever found yourself envious of somebody else around you, somebody who's not a Christian, and you wonder why they seem to live such a blessed life? Everything they touch seems to turn to gold. Everything you touch turns into something else. They're healthy. They appear to be wealthy. They appear to be happy. And everything in your life seems to be going wrong. I sometimes struggle with that, not necessarily in terms of financial terms, but in health. You know, some of you know I struggle with a few health issues, and one says nothing really big, but in other sense, things that you would look at me and go, oh, look at him, he's still, well, relatively young, and he's healthy. Well, as you may not know, I've been dealing with blood pressure issues now for 30 years. It's medicated, it's under control. The last couple of years, it started to go up again. It's time to adjust my medicines. And then I look at people who don't ride bikes, who don't work out, who don't go out for long walks, and I wonder, how on earth can that person be healthy in, inside, I'm not. David says, don't fret yourself over them. Why? Verse 2, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. One day they will get what's coming. They may appear green and healthy like grass as it blossoms for us here in the spring, but soon the summer will come. The blazing heat of the sun will burn it and it'll wither. Instead, David says, we're to trust in the Lord and do good. Do the opposite. You do what you're supposed to do. Dwell in the land. Remember, the land is connected with our relationship with God. We're in the land. We're healthy. We're in the land. We're being faithful. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Let that be what motivates you. Let that be what comforts you. Don't worry about the other guy. You do what you need to do. Then comes verse 4, one of my favorite verses in terms of just a profound thought, a beautiful idea there. David says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Make God your desire. Delight yourself in him. Seek to please him. Seek to know him. Seek to be filled by him in his spirit. Delight yourself in the Lord. Let that be what motivates you, not what your neighbor has or what your co-worker seems to get away with. Delight yourself in the Lord. And if that's the case, it says in verse 4, he'll give you the desires of your heart. If that's your prayer, if you want more of God, guess what? God will give you more of himself. And by the way, he's the only thing that can satisfy and fill you and please you anyway. Verse 5 continues, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as the noonday. You follow his will. You live in obedience to his commands. And God will put his spotlight on you, not the worldly spotlight. Verse 7, be still before the, Lord, before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Here comes again that word we started with. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. You sit and you wait on God. Don't compare yourself to your neighbor. Don't long for what he has. Don't wonder when one day, when are you going to get what you're due? You be still. You wait for God and you don't fret over those other things. Now, there are some other sins. Perhaps that's not the one that you struggle with, enviousness, covetousness of your neighbor. Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Refrain yourself from anger. Watch your temper. And forsake wrath, the idea of getting even. See, a lot of folks get mad. Some of us then seek to get even. We want to vent our frustrations to make somebody else pay for what frustrates us. That's sinful, David says, to refrain from it. Fret not yourself. That tends only to evil. Think of Jesus talking about anger as being the source of murder in the Sermon on the Mount. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. They'll get the relationship and maintain it. 
In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he'll not be there. Here comes another reference we pick up in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The meek shall inherit the earth, Jesus said. Psalm 37, verse 11. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. Think of a dog at the end of a leash snapping at you. That's the language of gnashing. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. It's kind of like, you know, we have two German shepherds at home. They come out, they're gnashing your teeth at you, barking. It's going to scare you. Now, flip side, somebody lets their chihuahua loose out on the front porch after you. It might bite, but it's not going to hurt you that much. It becomes humorous. That's God's view of the wicked. They think they're dangerous, and God laughs at them. The wicked draw the sword, and they bend their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those or those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. What they mean to do to others one day will come back on them. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of the many wicked. So again, tying this idea of our worrying about what others get and what we don't. It's better that you have little and be righteous than to have much and be wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord will uphold the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. So lean upon the Lord. Your day is coming. He'll protect you and keep you. His presence. Remember the prayer. Delight yourself in the Lord. That's your blessing. On the other hand, verse 20. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. The wicked borrows, but he does not pay back. By the way, borrowing and not paying back is like stealing. You took from somebody else and you didn't give it back. But the righteous, he's generous and he gives. Not only does he pay his debts, he gives more. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. There is that land language again, the language of the covenant, the presence of the Lord. But those cursed by him shall be cut off. Exiled is the, really the literal interpretation of the Hebrew there. They'll be excommunicated, sent away, executed, cut off. The steps of the man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. God will watch you and keep you if you delight in his way. Though he fall, though you struggle with sin, though you slip into temptation, he shall not be cast headlong. You won't be rejected ultimately, for the Lord upholds his hand. I've been young and now I'm old. Boy, how true is that for all of us? Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. In all of David's life, he says, I've seen many things. Think of all the things David encountered. But he's never seen God abandon ultimately the righteous because God will not. Remember the language of the steadfast love. How long does it endure? It endures forever. He is lending or ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. The righteous is known for his goodness and his children Raised in the same way, bless others as well. Therefore, turn away from evil, verse 27 begins, and do good. So shall you dwell, there's that idea, living forever. Remember the Psalms begin with, who shall dwell in the house of the Lord? Who shall live with him on the holy hill? Here's that theme still running with us. Who's going to do it? The one who turns away from evil and does good. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They're preserved forever. But the wicked, or the children of the wicked, shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Ultimately, we will not fall. The wicked, on the other hand, watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power. God will not abandon the righteous to the power of the wicked or let him be condemned when he's brought to trial. He's going to protect us. The eternal judgment, we will be found innocent because of our association with the truly innocent one, Christ. Wait for the Lord, verse 34 says. Yeah, notice again twice now. Waiting for the Lord. Keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. The ultimate promise, the presence of God for eternity. 
you will look on when the wicked are cut off, the judgment, and they're cast out for eternity. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree. But, verse 36, he passed away, and behold, he has no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. Mark the blameless, and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed, and the future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous, David says in verse 39, is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Remember, our comparison is not against those or with those around us, the wicked, not with each other even in church. Our comparison is God's perfect and holy righteousness. We're told to be holy because God is holy, and we're all going to fall short. But God has promised us, if we'll delight ourselves in him, if we'll seek him, if we'll pursue holiness and righteousness in him, in his Christ, we will find it, we'll inherit the land, not the land your house sits on, not the land that one day you hope to retire to, but as the old hymn used to say, the Beulah land. When we cross over the Jordan one last time, as we enter into the new heavens and the new earth, as we enter into the great new city, the new Jerusalem, then we shall inherit the land, God's presence, and we'll have it forever. And so while today we may struggle, while today you may feel poor, one day you'll be rich eternally. Trust in the Lord and wait on him.